I would like to now uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Christina Gren, uh, Gren. She also joined us now. Uh, she will be talking about, uh, let me just look at the, uh, okay, yeah. Her title would be Data Breaches in the Era of COVID-19, uh, Silent Identity Collection as an International Political Instrument, the weak experience of Balkan uh, region. It's a very uh, interesting uh, title. Uh, Hristina, you will have 20 minutes uh, to make your presentation. Hello, everyone. Merhaba herkese. Um, well, uh, I would like to uh, present myself. My name is Christina Kren. I am from Macedonia. I'm actually an undergraduate student. I'm not yet a doctor. So, but I, I really like research. Um, so today I'll be uh, specifically speaking about the data protection breaches in the Balkan region. Uh, how uh, the, norma the normativity or the normative uh, provisions of the legal um, world are not uh, implemented uh, uh, widely in the state apparatus of each Balkan country. So basically, my title is a little bit long, it's true, but I would like to depict with this title that uh, uh, some events that occurred during this um, uh, period of uh, COVID-19 that is already more or less that lasts eight or nine months. So basically, the titles uh, of my research topic is like data breaches in the year of COVID-19, silent, silent identity collection, and as an additional subtitle, the weak experience of the Balkan region. Well, um, I would like to uh, specifically mention that uh, the Balkan countries are actually Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. Uh, Greece as well. It's part of the Balkan Peninsula. Um, why I have mentioned in my title data breaches in the era of COVID-19, it is because actually uh, our institutional system uh, suddenly uh, could not uh, uh, implement a specific software protection for the, uh, the personal information of the COVID-19 infected uh, people who, uh, and actually there were um, COVID-19 leaks uh, regarding the patient records. So the, they were not only the human rights were viol violated, but also there was a violation of the right to privacy and also violation to the right of medical secret for the patient it's, uh, himself or herself. So also there was no respect for the notion of ethics and morality. Um, what happened, the background of this story is that in the Balkan region suddenly, when the, uh, when the um, lists was, were started to be, um, uh, the list of the people was, was uh, started to be published on social media. And we didn't know at first who published them. Like basically uh, the names, the share names, the, the, the date of birth, um, the email addresses and uh, even the home addresses of the people were published on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and uh, the countries were wondering who was doing this. So basically, uh, there were uh, over time some um, uh, some um, ineffective th that showed actually the ineffectivity of the data protection law. Uh, so suddenly, uh, the websites of the, especially in Macedonia, what I speak about the case of Macedonia, suddenly um, the, uh, the websites of the Ministry of Economy and Finance and even in, of Health and Education were hacked the websites. So that also signifies about the ineffectivity of uh, data protection law of the state apparatus. Basically, in the Balkan uh, region, uh, what I would like really to mention this uh, in the paper, it is uh, as, a, as an argument, is that in the Balkan region, there is the presence of nationalism. And we are still uh, solving the questions, the historical questions of the past. So there are ethnical problems and there are, uh, that are uh, connected with that phenomenon of um, uh, nationalism who started to actually to spread much more after the uh, breakup of Yugoslavia, actually in 1991. So we are having a significant um, legal system. We are having great legal systems, but all of them are theoretical. And the, 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 the jurists, the lawyers or judges 
are facing difficulties to implement the such legal provisions due to the political pressure. So currently in Macedonia, we are facing a story actually uh, um, the, the politicians are not speaking about the uh, problem of COVID-19 but they are speaking about solving the political problems between Greece and Macedonia, between Bulgaria and Macedonia, etc, etc. Uh, and that caused over time uh, the phenomenon of brain drain as well to emerge. So brain drain that means like young people like me and other ones are just leaving the country. So for instance, I was in Paris before, now I'm in Istanbul. And um, I have noticed that uh, currently in my hometown in Trilep, in Macedonia, uh, in the last six months, 2000 people abandoned or left the city. So that means that we are facing also a phenomenon of um, young of uh, old people, actually of old people. What I would like to say with that is that the old people are uh, dominant in the country. So the presence of um, of uh, older people is prevalent in the country. And there uh, starts the problem when old people, for instance, are trying to um, use the email addresses. They are not, uh, they do not know how to uh, cope with uh, internet problems. So too often they will open spam emails or uh, some fraudulent emails and uh, in these emails often some uh, hackers are asking these people to provide sensitive information such as the number of a credit card or um, the passwords of your social media accounts etc etc and over time this became a problematic situation where uh, we are trying to um, where the organizations the NGOs are trying to portray to the government but the governments are just they're talking and uh, portraying the art of empty rhetorics regarding the political problems of Macedonia and the other countries of the Balkan region, such as in the case of Bosnia as well, but they are not uh, focusing on the problem of COVID-19. So uh, suddenly we were having people um, who were uh, Actually, uh, yeah, there was the, uh, the, um, the process of evacuating people from abroad. And um, um, the, they were, uh, the, the provisions, the legal provisions regarding uh, keeping social distance, wearing masks were presented to, uh, uh, were presented and sent as a PDF files to all of these people who were uh, actually on the list for evacuation. But suddenly in the planes, uh, it could, they were uh, food, uh, they were, um, uh, camera uh, clips that were shared on social media portraying that the people were not respecting the rules regarding um, um, actually the uh, COVID-19 protection measures. And um, I would like to mention that now, now for each specific country, for each country specifically, so some other websites started to emerge such as for instance in um, uh, uh, Serbia started to emerge the a website coronavirusserbskoi.com that was actually publishing um, uh, the list also of uh, people who were uh, infected with COVID-19. And suddenly all of these lists, when they started to emerge, also in, started to emerge also in the city of Kumanovo and Ohrid in Macedonia, suddenly all of these people were subject to racist attacks, um, and uh, numerous um, attacks on their dignity, insults, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Over time, we have uh, not the organizations noticed that um, the, uh, the, um, in Croatia, basically, there was the website samoizolacja.hr, samoizolacja in the Balkan Slavic language, which means um, basically uh, self isolation. So this website actually started to publish the list of people who were um, um, who were ask, ask, actually asked to stay at home because they were already infected with COVID-19. So the, over time, the Constitutional Court of Croatia and uh, closed down basically this website. So we see that I that this weak experience of the Balkan region is not portrayed only um, by the ineffectivity of the uh, um, of in, by the ineffectivity of the system itself, but it's also portrayed by the unwillingness of the political figures 
to change the situation. So basically we're having a phenomenon of a collapsed health system. The public hospitals are incapable to um, um, provide healthcare uh, for uh, people. So basically in the same, it is very difficult it's, um, to build a new hospital. For build, building a new hospital, Macedonia takes uh, from four to five years. But in some countries, like such as Italy, during the era of COVID-19, they built a, a new hospital for four months. Um, and the problem of racism emerges in uh, Macedonia and uh, nearby countries is when uh, people start ethnically to attack each other. You're from that ethnicity, I'm from this ethnicity. So basically we are, um, um, they are portraying the the phenomenon of nationalism. They're saying that they are, they are patriotic, but that's not patriotism what it's about actually. Patriotism is more related to the love you're having for your own homeland, and rather than uh, saying that, uh, okay, uh, for instance, I can be Turkish and live in Turkey and be born in another country, but still feeling that I'm Turkish, for instance. So that is what uh, is patriotism, but nationalism is more attacking in the Balkan region, like they're attacking the other ethnical minorities. For instance, as a Balkan person, I can say that I am so happy that we have such a diverse group of people, Jewish, Muslims, Christians, that are speaking their local languages. And that is actually the treasure of the Balkan region where, uh, where we can speak in Turkish, in Macedonian, um, and uh, other Balkan languages. So we have a plethora of um, uh, diverse groups that are there, that they should, that they're supposed to promote the values of their culture. But since I was born from 1996, and there when I grew up until now, the, until the age of 24, I constantly, for instance, if I say I'm a Macedonian, I constantly receive uh, some attacks by people, not, uh, not in social media, fortunately, but they were saying, oh, you're from Macedonia, you're, you, are, you are Greek, you're a Bulgarian, you're Albanian, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I'm Macedonian, I was born in a Macedonian family. But that doesn't mean that in Macedonia, other groups are not existing, such as Turkish people. There is a, uh, almost 2% of Turkish people living in the country. There is a Jewish uh, community as well, they're Albanian. So it's a very um, uh, diverse community, which I'm very proud of. But the people that are living in Macedonia, they are not proud of that. And that I say it is due to the lack of the ineffectivity of the government to portray the cultural heritage of their own country. So um, in order to conclude, I would like to mention that um, regarding the COVID-19 in the um, uh, era, we are mentioning the notions of global health, uh, public health, but we do not mention the approach and the notion of one health. One Health combines the approach of, uh, or the connection between animal health, human health, and environmental health. Uh, we as human beings tend to, um, uh, we, are, uh, we are prone to promote the uh, human rights, human right, and to promote the provisions of the human rights conventions that are created by us or by the lawmakers, basically. But um, they are not speaking about the rights of the environment, uh, or the uh, basically the uh, rights of the animals. So One Health is, I am co collaborating with an NGO from the US um, as a social media intern where we are actually working on the uh, concept of One Health. So the organization is One Health Lessons and is founded by uh, Dr. Deborah Thompson, who is a, a veterinarian. And we're trying to not only speak about public health, global health, but also about One Health. and that is there when in the Balkan region, perhaps, and in this part, uh, uh, part of Turkey, perhaps, where we can promote the notion of One Health that will comprehend the, uh, you know, not only the human rights conventions, but also the, uh, the uh, charter of the environment for say, preserving the environment or the charters for, um, uh, for the animals' rights, uh, about the treatment, equal treatment uh, for different kinds of animals, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the way I would like to conclude that um, COVID-19 um, as, a, as a disease or as a pandemic, uh, we know that there are plenty of conspiracy theories that COVID-19 was used as a method to reduce the world's population, which is one of the conspiracy theories, but it's a fact that exists. 
And uh, plenty of people do not know that COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. So we need to study the nature of the disease in order to determine what will be the consequences. So as a zoonotic disease, that means that the disease itself was transmitted from an animal to human. It exists, it's a fact. Um, even though there are some other conspiracy theories saying that coronavirus was um, created in a laboratory, but whatever it was created, we know that it's a zoonotic disease and that is currently we should tackle the problem of um, uh, that is impeded actually uh, by uh, the tackle, to tackle the problem that uh, the politicians are, um, are incapable of solving it. But as human beings, we should promote the notion of one health in order to say like, you know, COVID-19 is not only infecting human beings, but also animals. And that's also a, a very, uh, um, it is very difficult for the environment as well. So we, if, if we live in harmony with nature, as we say, the popular saying, um, we can perhaps promote the notion of one health. Uh, and this is what I would like to uh, argue also in the paper, the notion of one health by promoting the weak experience of the Balkan region, by stating that uh, perhaps as also Mary Curie said um, during her novel uh, a speech, um, um, she said basically in this life, nothing is to be feared, but one is to, it is necessary to understand that. So if we understand the, the origin of COVID-19, that is a zoonotic disease, perhaps we can explain more the uh, ineffectivity of the government policies and the politicians who are literally are not aware about the origin of COVID-19, etc. So basically this is my conclusion. Dear Krishna, thank you very much Welcome. for your presentation. So now uh, we have finished all three presentations. The speeches have been completed now, and it's time for the discussion. Now the floor will be yours, uh, our participants. Uh, when you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand, and or maybe you can just open your microphone and ask your question. Please just, uh, you can introduce yourself and uh, tell us uh, who you are uh, directing your question. Okay, the floor is yours now. No question? I think Nezir Oja will ask a question maybe. No, Zahima is asking question on chat. Huh. Huh, on chat, okay, let me have a look. Okay, yes, it's a long question. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all the speakers for great talk. Any speaker can respond to my question. It's about data protection laws. How do you see transborder data flow between nation states? What mechanism should be used to govern cross-border data flow in the environment when nations do not trust each other? United Nations uh, conferences are not successful neither UN organization, I don't know, or OEG, regarding governing cyberspace. Your comment, comments, please. Uh, Dr. Burak, would you like to maybe say anything about this? Yes, maybe. Actually, uh, I think uh, this the answer to this, to this question is, um, is not uh, very rigid. Uh, actually, I don't have any idea about the recent mm -hmm. developments but uh, Zahima I think asks about the dead data protection laws in general so I think we can say that mm -hmm. these kinds of laws uh, from time to time are um, uh, regula regulated they are put into practice but I think these uh, reflect the interest of the big powers for example in the EU some particular countries uh, uh, prepare such laws and then they make a, an, an election process uh, in uh, between themselves and then they uh, try to implement this. But outside, outside the borders of the EU, again, there emerged some problems. For example, a hacker from um, Netherlands, you know, uh, can hack a Middle Eastern country uh, to the inhabitants living in, in, in Lebanon, maybe. So uh, I'm not sure which, uh, which countries, you know, uh, national law will be used in this process, mm -hmm. the Netherlands or the Lebanon 
or e e does EU hold specific rules about this? So I think this data regulation uh, laws or data protection uh, arrangements are generally are always updated, and I think they are not very very successful in uh, fighting this uh, problems. So cross border data flows or other you know problems. I think uh, we cannot easily solve these problems even. Uh, even we use the United Nations or EU or Council of Europe, even such is strong international organizations. I think they, they are not strong enough because they cannot implement these rules to, to the borders outside their mm -hmm. uh, member states. Uh, and uh, in terms of United Nations GGE conferences, can Zahima unmute yourself and show yourself to us? Maybe you can uh, explain because uh, actually I don't know what U UNGG conferences stand for. Zahima. Uh, yes, let me just give me a minute. Yes. Turn your video, Zahima. <laughs> Please. Right now you are unmuted and we cannot see you, but of course I don't know what this UNGGE uh, conference, so I think they are the abbreviation of course for something, but maybe you have the, the definition. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, the, uh, I'm using it from my mobile, so a video is not getting on. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, we can hear. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, uh, actually, uh, United Nations GGE are a uh, group of government experts. And uh, the OE, uh, WG, it is open-ended group discussion. Na? So uh, these two groups, United Nations actually uh, made back in 2013 or 2012. And it was about governing cyberspace between all nation states. And now what happened was all, uh, uh, all nations, they became the member of UNGGE group of uh, governmental experts and they talked about how to govern cyberspace because cyberspace is very uh, you know critical and very uh, multifold uh, uh, environment or arena you can say where uh, uh, for for me uh, it can be freedom of speech but for other it can be my freedom of speech can be or my freedom of action can be critical threat to their critical infrastructure so all nations you know uh, they, they uh, they did not agree on single or unanimous notion uh, or any rules and any regulations on which they can, you know, work on. There was they, they, uh, they started becoming. Uh, there was two groups in UNGGE. One was followed by, uh, you know, uh, United States of America, and the other one was Chinese group. US. They uh, they wanted to make it open for all, open space for all, and Chinese they wanted it to be. Uh, you know, strict and there should be controls on it and, you know, like other Chinese policies. So uh, the uh, United Nations held two to three conferences. Uh, one was in 2015. The uh, latest one was in 2017. But all these conferences, they did not succeed because of the same reason. Because, uh, you know, uh, how can one nation trust on another uh, uh, once? Uh, uh, yesterday, Dr. Nazir, he was saying, that uh, in cyberspace, we don't know our enemies. I mean, we don't know that our neighbor is our enemy or he's our friend. So in cyberspace, it happens. The same goes for uh, different nations. So my question was that uh, since United Nations, uh, both conferences, GGE and open-ended group, it is actually initiated by Russians and Chinese and Indians are also there. So both are not successful. So how can we say that uh, uh, we can govern cyberspace in term terms of uh, now there are many important terms like data protection laws and privacy, like uh, Mr. Murat has talked about. And uh, there, then uh, there is another very important issue that is data flow. One person is sitting in one country and its data is being used or misused by technology companies in another country. So, yes. uh, I mean, uh, these are very important uh, uh, questions which needs to be answered. And uh, yes, you are right. Your all presentations were very good and I thoroughly enjoyed each one of that. Uh, and we all uh, need to think about it that how can these governments, I mean, are there any legal entities or are there legal rules, regulations, conventions, which can be followed? I mean, there should be one, anything, I mean, which should be followed to capture all these different issues. Thank Actually, you very much. I think I am clear to everyone. Yes, 
Thank you, Zaima. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, I saw a news uh, yesterday. For example, the coronavirus va 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 vaccines, vaccines, Action. they were they were still vaccines. stolen. Mm. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so this means that even the EU or the very very big drug companies they cannot, you know, yeah. fight this problem. So. It's very hard because uh, again they will continue to use this uh, machine uh, machine uh, um, formulas. Even uh, it is you know it, it has stolen by some hackers. There were some news, but again they are trying to use it. So that's very true. Yes. Thanks for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for Zahima's question and Dr. Begum for your answer. Maybe we can say really it's because of the nature of the cyber uh, space. Let's say it's, it's really difficult to uh, take the proper measures, you know, in terms of protection of the, the data. It will be very difficult, but uh, it will be depend on the international cooperation at the moment. Uh, uh, as long as the international cooperation intensifies, uh, all the nations, uh, you know, under the United Nations or other international you know, governmental organizations, if they are ready to, to work together, to cooperate together, maybe uh, some solutions and some, let's say, measures, uh, protective measures uh, could be found. Uh, of course, one of the big, biggest problems uh, in international law is the um, issue of the jurisdiction, whether the national, of course, you know, the, the crimes are subject to the national jurisdiction. Uh, maybe in the future, if the agreements um, uh, um, is reached between the uh, most of the nations. Maybe uh, this, uh, let's say, um, data protection violation could be accepted uh, to be subject to the universal uh, jurisdiction in terms of the uh, national jurisdictions. Maybe that could be uh, a solution in the future. But at the moment, we are far from, uh, let's say, this uh, agreement or uh, this kind of uh, notion. Um, let's see then. Uh, thank you very much, Zahima. Kamil, Kamil is raising the hair. Thank you for presentation, Prof. Uh, I just want to make one comment firstly. The, uh, Dr. Begum told yesterday this, some hackers attacked uh, this company from Germany for vacancy. Actually, mm -hmm. they didn't attack the formulae. They just attacked to see how the presentation because that company was uh, supposed to make presentation for statesmen, for government, and for institution. They just told the information about presentation. And the other issue with uh, Zahima told, the problem in the cyberspace is there is no cyber trust. Like the, each government perceived the traits and meaning of conflicts differently. For this, like China using different terms for the approach, the USA is, uh, approach is different from them. So they cannot make a consensus about like the cyber governance in the international. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Kamil, for your uh, contributions. Any other Thanks. questions? Ah, right, Nazir, Nazir. Okay, okay. Nazir. I have uh, two comments, maybe one question for Christina. Uh, first of all, uh, okay, we have problem of cyber law in international relations, particularly. I mean, there is no one, even one uh, treaty, uh, I mean, among the United Nations uh, member countries. There are some regional conventions, such as the um, uh, the European Convention uh, on uh, Cyber Crimes by the Council of Europe. Uh, there is one convention by the African Union and also uh, Arab League. And then we have nothing else. So there is no cooperation at the international level. The second one, even if you have cooperation among the states, uh, it is not enough to provide security to provide some sort of um, safety for data transference in international relations because uh, cyberspace is not a state-centric domain. It is much more um, run by the private companies and dominated by the private companies. 
And therefore, uh, if you don't, I mean, take all the stakeholders in the process of um, cyber governance, uh, including the, the, the governments, the uh, companies, international organizations, and also NGOs that are dealing with the internet. We cannot uh, manage this space. So uh, first of all, we have to solve this problem. Of course, Russia and China, they try to um, develop some sort of uh, treaties, but the, the proposals they have submitted so far, uh, they are not, to be honest, not uh, proposals that are um, approaching a free and safe cyberspace. Instead, they would like to control, to monitor cyberspace at the global level. So therefore they do not get the support of other international actors. Uh, regarding, okay, the second issue when, okay, Christina talking about the animal rights, the, okay, in general, the uh, protection of ecosystem uh, without making any difference between the elements of the ecosystem. Yeah, that was more related to COVID-19 as a notion regarding the an origin of COVID-19. I was more referring to that. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, still, but you know, like, uh, right to have a clean environment is also a human right. So we cannot exclude uh, environment or animals uh, completely from the human rights uh, discourse, human rights uh, regulations. Of course, they are not, I mean, human beings are at the center of human rights. Yeah. Uh, and like Heidegger, I mean, he does not make any differentiation between even trees and human beings. They, I mean, he, you know, he does not like to use he or she. He uses it for every I and mean, for human beings because when you use he or she, that means you are giving a special importance to human beings. So there is also this this view is quite strong among environmentalists, and this is understandable. Uh, but you know, like when you uh, enlarge the concepts that um, such the comprehensive that covers everything, then you lose the focus, okay, the focus point. So if you are talking about the rights, let's say, if you uh, are talking about, of course, I mean, they are all interrelated, inter integrated, but I mean, human rights, okay, it's a specific topic, and then you can focus on it, you can discuss it, develop it, whatever, anyway. But when you say, okay, it just should be about the rights of everything. Uh, I didn't get the concept you are using, like one right? No, it is actually a new concept. Uh, we are sp it's about the concept of one health. It started to, it's a, it's a new phenomenon. I'm one health? One health, okay. one health. You are speaking about global health, about yeah. public health, mm -hmm. but we're not speaking about one health as a notion. So that's a new theory actually that I, I wanted to um, mention about. Okay. so. That's quite good, I mean, a useful concept. But where, in terms of functionality, I mean, you know, like when you enlarge the concepts, then it's difficult to get the support or to even get some um, sort of regulations. Uh, so I don't know what, I mean, I don't, I have no any idea about the, the details of this concept. Uh, what is the, let's say, approach and how to solve, I mean, all these problems together, actually. I mean, I would like to uh, read something about it, but um, I would prefer to have, I mean, okay, these subjects separated. So it is better to focus just on one subject and then um, otherwise we will lose the, the point. That's actually, actually what I was mentioning, just briefly, if I can say, 
at what was mentioning like uh, regarding the what I, what is my research oriented on i am more focused on you know when i'm trying to cope with social sciences and, and law at the same time with my different uh, undergraduate degrees is that i try to combine approaches or theories and uh, make our um, like how to say not to criticize the authors but trying to say like you know in a comparative approach this author is right for this and this rather is wrong for this in my opinion um definitely it is a very large at the same time but this is you know just the scope for this presentation i wanted just to promote also the concept of one health which is not as very unknown for the uh, legal uh, specialist as well because it's a concept that's coming from veterinary medicine as well but it's very much related to legal medical health as well regarding COVID 19 especially as a zoonotic disease okay thank you you're welcome Okay, thank you very much, Professor Nizir Akechinman and uh, Hristina for your contributions. Now, uh, I would like to turn to our uh, uh, participants. Any other question? Uh, 